Let's open our Bibles to uh, the book of Revelation. And we're going to be in chapter 7, verse 9, but I, it's hard for me not to mention the fact that if you at all are paying attention to anything going on in the news, you notice something that's of biblical proportions. Uh, the Bible said 2,600 years ago that the last conflict that would set off the end of the world would be between Persia and Israel. Now, that was 2,600 years ago when Persia was a big thing. It had just, you know, knocked out Babylon and, you know, was, was coming up the Medes and the Persians, that whole deal. But Persia got knocked off by Alexander the Great, who got knocked off by, you know, uh, his dissolute life. But then his empire got taken over by the Roman Empire. And so kind of people, and then, you know, the Babylons wiped out Israel, so it's kind of like, that'll never happen. And look, 2,600 years later, what is... What has got the attention of everybody that knows what's going on and fears what could happen? Like the Kremlin and the Pentagon and every Gulf state and everybody that has any military know-how around the world. It's Iran has set its sights. I mean, it's like a sniper scope and they've got one thing in their sights. It's Israel. I mean, there wasn't an Israel nationally until 1948 and there wasn't an Iran until not very long before. It's, it's just amazing that what the Bible says 2,600 years ago, you're reading about in the news. Iran made some missiles totally to kill Israelis. Sent them in cargo planes, and they've been ferrying them for about three months now, fast as they can. You know, you don't want to shake them too much. They bring them across the desert, across Iraq, land in Damascus, carefully take them out, stick them in a bunker, and they've just packed that bunker full with missiles that can reach any spot of Israel. And so over the weekend, Israel said, well, I think you got that firecracker chest full enough. Let's light the fuse. And they blew the whole thing up, and it's just filling the news. Now, the problem with that is Israel didn't do it because they know that they're the chosen people of promise, the people of God. But sooner or later, they're going to get backed into a corner where they have no one to turn to but God. And boy, watch the fireworks then. But that's not what I'm speaking on this morning. Uh, let's go to chapter 7 and verse 9. And what you're opening to is, and I like to call this your personal copy of the almighty God of the universe writing down everything that he believes is important for you to know. The almighty God. And he's going to reveal himself this morning to us in several ways as we read his word. But the primary one, and, and, and I was thinking about this as I was getting ready for this week. I, I was standing in line, uh, you know, at the, uh, where they all come out of the airport on the second floor, you know, by all those cute people that I love all the stuff that they have built in our new airport. And uh, I was standing there waiting by the grand piano for the gates to open for Bonnie to get home. And she was the very last flight and it was after 12. And I was just standing there smiling. Smiling, and all of a sudden someone from the church was on the other side. Well, it wasn't Bonnie. And I thought, she must be at the back of the plane. So I smiled and they thought that I was smiling at them. So they came right over and we had the biggest talk. And I was thinking through while I was standing there, my sermon this morning, and when I heard what they're going through in their life, in their family, in their job, and, and by the way, they triumphantly are going through it, I thought, did you know if you came this morning to Calvary Bible Church because you got up and wanted to come and meet with the people of God and you, you know, take a look at the bullets and you see, oh, the seals. Oh. What could that possibly have applic applicability to my life? Well, what I want to tell you is that the seals of Revelation tell us God is completely in control and knows everything that's happening. And I want you to think about that with me just before we read this text because I want you to think about the implications of what you're reading, okay? At the end of days, as Satan is empowering one man to win the world, he offers to satisfy all of mankind's desires for peace and safety. Now, do you understand what we're talking about is the Antichrist. The most talked about individual in prophecy has 33 different names in the Bible. We're going to read several of them this morning. This man is the embodiment of everything humans have always wanted. He is the ultimate Superman. And I personally, my personal opinion is 
that he will shock people because he will be so un-super looking. I mean, I don't believe the Antichrist is a reincarnation of Arnold Schwarzenegger when he used to be Mr. Universe, you know. I mean, that guy just, his legs were this big around, literally. I know, I, I had two meals with him and I had to say I was looking at those legs. I wondered, <laughs> I mean, are those real? And uh, I mean, he's just, now he's all flabby now, but, uh, but the Superman that's coming is going to amaze the world, not because he can take steroids and lift weights. It's because he's going to have the complete power of Satan behind him. Satan has always waited for God to give him this opportunity. In fact, I believe he's had his man in the wings all along, every generation since the Garden of Eden. And, and he knew that there's going to come a time when God's going to pull back the restraint or the restrainer, the Spirit of God, and is going to allow Satan to, to burst on the scene. But he doesn't want to come himself. He wants to come through a human. And that's who is being introduced to us this morning in Revelation 7, 9 is part of it, but 6, 2 is where we're going. This substitute for Jesus Christ, set forward by Satan, is the Antichrist, and God describes the launch of this event. So you say, what can that possibly affect me with? Well, listen, why are we studying the launch of this event? Because Revelation shows us God is in charge. Satan is wanting to launch this guy all along. God has a plan. Now you say, you say, how does that affect me? Well, when you hear that you're losing your job or losing your pension or losing your health or that your child is rejecting God and going an absolutely different way and your whole life falls apart because of the lost health or lost job or lost child, guess who wasn't surprised? God. See, the, the first thing we need to realize is that when God looks at, at human history, it's kind of like a flat floor. From beginning to end is all in front of him at the same time. God is above time. He's not in it. He's not flowing with it. He is above it seeing, the Bible says, the end from the beginning. You see, he sees the whole flow Nothing surprises him. Your job, your health, your child didn't surprise God. That's, that's an element of the doctrine of God that sometimes we don't realize. Now think of the implications in your life because right here, God is directing the ending of human history. That's what Revelation is about. And, and as we look at this study of eschatology, you think, and, and people come to me all the time. I had people come to me this week and they say, people are hurting. How can you be preaching about that? I says, if they're listening, they'll understand how I can be preaching about that. You see, God is directing the end of human history and he wrote it down over 2,000 years ago. He sees the whole thing. And if God sees the whole thing, He's told us he also sees every individual part. And he sees it with the same precision we're looking at here. Satan is not allowed to launch his Antichrist until the instant God sends that white horseman into the world. Then Satan gets the message, ah, I can do what I want to do. God is running things. God is in control. God is the one orchestrating the events of this universe. Revelation lessons are great, you, but you think, boy, what about me? I lost my job, or my kids are getting bullied at school, or my parents are so ill, all I do is take care of them, and I don't know how I'm going to go on. Or my daughter is dating this fellow at school, and he's not even saved, and, and she's getting turned away from us and the Lord. And that might be one of thousands of different conflicts that are going within us. And you know, that's what life is really about. I mean, most of us, we love the Lord, we have the word and we think about it, and then we set it down and we think about real life. What the Lord wants us to do is to merge those two things. As you listen today, you will note that God knows everything in advance, 
That means not just the seals that we're looking at in chapter 6, but the job you lost last week, the health of your baby that is not yet born, and the outcome of next month's surgery or job interview will not surprise God, even though it surprises us. See, we need to apply the doctrine of God to our lives. A study of Revelation confirms to us the doctrine of God. Nothing misses God's sight. It's amazing how we act like the Lord didn't know that was going to happen. And, and, and people get grieved, and then they get upset at the Lord, and then they get nervous, and they get anxious, and then they, their faith is shaken as if the Lord didn't know, which is the center of why he's God, because of his omniscience, omnipresence, and that other omni that goes with it, omnipotence, that nothing happens without him allowing it. God is the God who knows all of history in advance. He is the God who is revealed as not passive. And Almighty God is at work guiding every event, watching over every disaster. Now, we look at life waiting for the next thing to happen. God looks and knows everything that's going to happen. And he knows it in advance, and he has already orchestrated what he wants to be the outcome of every single part, of all the disasters, of all the events, and of every gain in our life, every loss in our life, and God orchestrates it perfectly. That's just simply the doctrine of God. But there's a second doctrine that Revelation gives us. Not just the doctrine of God, that God is totally in control, that nothing misses his gaze, that he's not surprised by anything, and not only is he not surprised, he allowed that to happen, and he has a purpose for it. But there's another element. A study of Revelation also reminds us of the doctrine of redemption. In fact, I was thinking uh, with uh, Dave and Linda, the whole family, about their dear mother's home going this week, Friday night late, and that, that uh, has been alluded to already. And I thought about the fact that the first thing that, that Elsie, I mean, after she saw Jesus' face, looked up and he walked her home, Jesus walked her to where the saints are gathering. In fact, in just a few moments, we're going to celebrate communion. Did you know this morning, there are more of us worshiping God this morning than have ever been in history? Do you know why? Because all of us who are born again in the world are worshiping him today, but everyone who's ever existed that has by faith come to the Redeemer and have bowed before him and called on his name are already assembled around the throne. And they're there singing to the one who redeemed them. And Elsie just joined a huge group. And she began singing about the one who redeemed her. That, if you read Revelation 4 and 5 that we covered a few months back, that's the theme of our song. What is the doctrine of redemption? Well, God redeemed us with Christ's blood, so we're blood-bought. That means God wants us to give him his undivided devotion that he deserves. As the one who purchased us, he said, I have one way of communicating with you. I speak through my word. You listen as you read and prayerfully ask me to speak to you. This is my communication device. So you know what? We live in the most fantastic time. You can tell how godly you are by your two communication devices. The electronic one, that you know exactly how to charge, you know how to make it work, you don't let it get in the water, you put protective cases on it, you're always uploading and getting new whatever's for it. We know this well. Then we have this communications device. Which one are we more adept at using? How clearly can we hear from one and how unclearly do we hear from the other? That's a real measure this morning of how godly you are because this connects you with the temporary. This connects us with the eternal, with the one who redeemed us, the one who bought us with his own blood and said, I want your undivided attention. I want you to spend time undistractedly looking at me. You know, it's amazing when two people are in love. Have you ever seen two people in love? It's almost like they don't even notice anybody else. They just... 
They stare at each other. I mean, it, explosions can go off. They just stare at I mean, they're just transfixed. Did you know the Lord says, you're supposed to give me your undivided attention. Looking in a glass, beholding the glory of the Lord. That's the bottom line of the doctrine of redemption. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so by the response of their life, the scriptures say. Well, God wants us to listen to him. God wants us to follow him. God wants us to love him so much that we trust him that he already knows about the future. We listen to him. We see, as we look at Revelation, 2,000 years ago, he told us exactly what was going to happen. He told us he's going to withhold the, the, the evil one from coming until the instant that God planned for him to come. And we, we know all that. But when our little disaster, our little personal disaster comes, we act like it caught God off guard. That's how people act. They just act like God doesn't even know as much as they do. And the Lord says, no. The lesson I want to give you today is that you need to trust me. Now, why should we trust God? Because if you've read this, some really bad times are coming. And I'm not talking about famine and scarcity and meteorites and hailstones and everything else. Do you know what's really coming? The Bible says, and and Revelation 6, verse 2 tells us, the next thing that's coming is a global deception. You know what that is? That's when the whole world believes a lie. And the whole world begins to worship this Superman fella, the Antichrist. Revelation 6 has already told us that God is launching a white horseman to rapidly fill the earth with false and deceptive peace. And in a very short time, almost the whole earth will follow this emissary of Satan in human flesh called the Antichrist. And that's probably the saddest commentary on humanity, that God himself came down to walk on earth and people by and large almost universally rejected him, but a puny human, totally filled with the devil, gets the attention of everybody and they worship him. Well, let me show you a bright spot. That's why I had you turn to chapter 7, verse 9. The Antichrist, like Satan, comes to kill and steal and destroy. But as the end of the physical world approaches and Earth's darkest spiritual hour arrives in the tribulation, God has a surprise planned. Do you know what that surprise is? It's in verse 9. Look look at what it says. I'm just going to read it to you real quickly. After these things I looked and behold, John's up there in heaven and he's getting this guided tour. And after he saw all these uh, sealed uh, tribes of Israel, so that means Israel's going to survive into the tribulation and God's going to pick 12,000 from every tribe and they're going to be these evangelists. That's what chapter 7 says. But look at verse 9. A multitude which no one could number of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and they're crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, you know what? A lot of people throughout history have read those verses, and you should read what the commentaries say. They say, well, this probably speaks of the product of global missions for the last 2,000 years, or this probably speaks of the church's conquest as they're finally going to conquer the world. I'm so glad that John taps the angel and says, uh, this is really neat, but who are all those people? He actually asks that. Uh, look at what he says in verse 13. And one of the elders answered and said to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. In other words, tell me. John says, This is amazing. Who are they? Well, look at verse 14. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Do you know what these are? This is the surprise that God has for Satan as he ramps up his great deception. God plans to save many people during the tribulation. How many? John said, more than can be counted. That's a surprise to the devil. I mean, he's got everybody worshiping him, but down deep there are these people that love the truth, and God has given them a love for the truth, and they are saying, this guy's powerful, but there must be something else. And these people come to Christ in the most dark and horrific time. Satan has seen God's word. Satan knows God's plan. He can read. He can read. He's seen that there's this 
numberless crowd. So Satan has deployed legions of liars and false signposts pointing people away from Christ. Do you know why today uh, Satan doesn't have to really work with the drug culture because that kind of keeps itself going. He doesn't have to work with the, you know, whole immoral flesh industry. That kind of keeps itself going. He doesn't have to work with all the alcohol and, and substances that people use to make themselves happy. That keeps itself going. Do you know where Satan is most diligently at work in the whole world? In the worship realm. And mostly in the false worship realm where he gets people to twist to, to only partially share the gospel, to deny the deity of Christ, to deny his substitutionary atonement, to deny the inerrancy of his word or the authority of the word, and to say, well, Paul made mistakes, and, you know, that's Old Testament, and the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament, and make people kind of like Satan's at work in professors across the world who come up and pollute the minds of their students and make them doubt the God of their father and mother and the God of the word of God. Satan is there. Deception is what he's into. But when you and I call in the name of the Lord, he saves us not only from our sins, but he delivers us from the power of darkness and from the eternally damnable lies of the evil one. Satan is a liar. Now, turn back to chapter 6 in verse 2. That's the verse we're looking at this week, and in two weeks we'll, Lord willing, finish it. But Revelation 6, 2, that white horseman we met last week, is a reminder from God that the coming Antichrist initially conquers, not militarily. You notice he's carrying the bow, he's not using it, he's given a crown. He doesn't win a crown, he doesn't fight and defeat and take a crown, he's given a crown. By the way, Revelation 13, 7 tells us that that crown is the authority God gives him to get the whole world's attention and worship. But God deploys this force for deception in the first seal in this global pervasive delusion. God has planned to send confusing false teaching and delusion into the world. Why would God do that? Because God is sending it so that those that love the truth will stand out. Think about Today, just as during the tribulation years, there are only two types of people on the planet. Truth lovers, truth haters. And this morning, Revelation 6-2 says, God is going to send out deception so that he can see who are the truth lovers and who are the truth haters. Now, if you take a moment, turn in your Bibles now back to 2 Thessalonians because you might think this is the only place in Revelation this is talked about. It's not. 2 Thessalonians, it goes like this. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, now we want to go to 2. It's a little tiny short three-chapter epistle and go to the middle, chapter 2. To help us understand what God is doing in Revelation 6, we need to turn the spotlight of the rest of Scripture. Now this idea of being a lover of the truth was the theme of Paul's first letters. Remember Paul wrote half the New Testament, Paul planted churches all over the known ancient world. And as Paul went, he would minister, he would plant churches, he would teach. Then when he left, he would write them letters. Those are called epistles. The epistles are letters Paul wrote back to churches that he had either founded or that he knew about that needed an inspired letter that God told him to write. What's interesting is 1 and 2 Thessalonians are the first epistles Paul wrote. Did you know what 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are almost exclusively about? Eschatology. I have people, they say, what, what reason is there to teach about prophecy? That's not an important doctrine. Oh, really? A fourth of the Bible is about prophecy and Paul's first two epistles? I mean, the apostle to the Gentiles, what did he write his first two epistles about? The rapture and the tribulation. You'd say, that isn't what I would teach an early church about. I know, that's why you're not the Lord. God chose what the early church needed to know about. He wanted to give them hope that they were going to not be left for the wrath, but then he wanted to tell them about what his plans were for the world. So with that in your mind, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And what we're going to read here is what Paul explains to these people who had heard his six weeks of ministry, heard his sermons about the return of Christ, heard his... his 
all of his teaching about God's plan for the church. And then those people started hearing false teachers. And they started getting confused. And they had these false letters written to them. And Paul writes this back to them to clarify everything. So this is our text we're going to read this morning. You were wondering if we ever got to it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to read the first 12 verses. Let's stand together, you follow along in your Bibles, and listen to these incredible words and look at what Paul says, the lesson those people needed. And that lesson is they need to love the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, And are gathering together to him, we ask you, verse 2, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Verse 6, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow. God says, save people, receive from God a love for the truth. This morning, if you're born again, You love the truth. You want the truth. Unsaved people don't love truth. They have pleasure in unrighteousness. And they don't love the truth. Let's bow before God this morning. Father in heaven, I pray that each of us who know you, who have your spirit living within us, would love the truths you've presented us with from your word this morning. The first one is that loving the truth initiates or comes, is initiated by you. It comes from you. We weren't born lovers of truth. We love darkness. We had to be saved to become lovers of truth. I pray for anyone who hasn't had that work in their life that they become a lover of truth, that right now they would cry out to you. But Lord, if we love the truth, then we know that you're in charge, that you know the end from the beginning that you've already written it down, that nothing takes you by surprise, not what our son or daughter did this week or last week or last month, not what's going to happen next year. Nothing takes you by surprise. What you're wanting from us when all these things happen is for us to trust you, to reach out to you, to like a child make sure you're there and then to feel your arms around us. I pray that we would love the truth about you, O God. The doctrine that you know all things, control all things, you work all things for your glory, and the doctrine of redemption, that we belong to you. And nothing will happen to us apart from your perfect plan, nor will anything happen to those we love apart from your perfect plan. I pray that we would strive to know your plan, and as we sang this morning, that we would be ready to do your will. The communion that we celebrate this morning is a communion where we say, Lord, we want to follow you. We want to do your will. We want to trust you. We want to renew our desire to listen to you. 
so that we can know your truth. Speak to our hearts to that end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, the men are going to prepare to service communion because that's what we're doing this morning. But while you're sitting in your chair, what I would encourage you to do is make your seat a little altar, a little shrine of consecration to the Lord. And say, Lord, you are my God. I want to be your servant. A servant does the will of another. I want to do your will. I want your will done in my life. And make this communion a renewal of your surrender to do his will. Let's just prepare for a few minutes quietly with our heads bowed, and then I will take a little time to pray before the men serve us communion. Father, we're bowed before you. Some hearts are engaged right now in surrender. Others are just wandering. They're not used to your presence. They're not used to focusing on you. They're not even used to quietness. Use these quiet moments to remind us of the doctrine of God. You're in control. You know everything long before it happens. You knew it from the beginning. Nothing surprises you. Everything surprises us. May we reach out to you now and say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want you to go in front of me, and when surprises come, they won't surprise you, and I'll just cling to you and say, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to know? How do you want me to respond? I'm following you. I pray that we'd renew our redemption tie to you, that you bought us so we no longer live for ourselves. As 2 Corinthians 5 says, we live but unto you instead of unto ourselves. And may we, as we partake of the bread this morning, realize that blessed truth that we were bought at a price. Therefore, we need to glorify you by being your servants and doing your will. Thank you for inviting us to this table. Help us to worship you as we sing, as we meditate, and as we partake. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. The men are going to pass the bread to us, and we're going to sing about the cross of Jesus Christ this morning. And I, as we come to that, that one line that says, so I'll cling to the old rugged cross, think about that's what the Christian life is about. God gives us daily strength just to make it through a day. And when we get washed away by the events, he said, just cling. Cling to what I did for you on the cross. Cling to me, and I'll carry you through. Let's remember that as we sing to him this morning. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So how cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. The second stanza, it's a choice every day. I held up the phone in the Bible. There's an attraction factor there. You can measure your health this morning. Which attracts you more? Being up to date on media and music and, and, and entertainment? Do you know every super pop star and don't even know the minor prophets? 
That's an indication of your spiritual health. There's a wonderful attraction in the cross. Do you know what Paul said in Galatians 6? God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Christ by whom I am crucified to the world. It loses its attraction. And the world is crucified to me. It loses its connection. I'm still in the world, but I'm not connected anymore. I'm an ambassador. I'm no longer a part. I am crucified with Christ. That's what we're singing about. And let's sing that before we partake. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So how cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. You know, that last line is what captured me this week. I've been meditating on what 1 Corinthians 9 means. Did you know that there's a crown that every one of us are offered by Jesus Christ? It's the crown for those who deny the desires of their flesh, who say no to immorality, to overindulgence, to laziness, to all of the manifestations, to the lustfulness, to the greed, to the envy, to the anger that, that takes over at times. All those are, are manifestations of the flesh. Read about them in Galatians 5. It says, the works of the flesh are manifested, and there's 19 sins. Those that are systematically as concerned about those sins as they are about the dandelions in their yard, you know, concerned about those sins as they are about the shine of their car or the newness of their electronic guilt. Those who are concerned about denying the flesh, there's a crown. You know that line says, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross, I'll be crucified with Christ, till I exchange it someday for a crown. It's the First Corinthians 9. Crown for those who deny the desires of the flesh. Now you say, that's impossible. Yeah, it is. That's why it's only possible through Christ. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. He said, do this remembering me and let's partake together. Dear Father in heaven, you've told us that the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You've also told us that the most powerful being that you ever created in this universe, the devil himself, Lucifer, has another name. And that name is that he is the accuser, the slanderer. His name is actually the slandering one. He slanders you by accusing us of our sins. Every one of us here who are born again know that we're sinners and we're so painfully aware when we sin. But we forget sometimes that if you paid for one sin, you've paid for all of them and that when you save us, you save us to the uttermost and that means that there's not one sin that tips the balance. But sometimes we forget that and we start listening to the devil and he whispers in our ear, God doesn't want you anymore. You've prayed that same prayer and told him you'll never do that again so many times. Give up. And he accuses us. And I pray that we would silence him and start silencing him right at this communion where we say, no, Jesus has paid the whole price. He died once for all my sins. All of my sins are forgivable, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has already once and for all forgiven me. 
And all I need is to come to him and he will cleanse me. But he cleanses me because I'm already once and for all forgiven. Oh, Lord, may this cup that we are going to hold and then partake of soon be a cup of blessing. May it be the blessing that we learn by faith to silence the accuser who tries to neutralize our lives by pointing at our sins. May we point at our Savior who already took our sins and thank you for what you've done. In the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. As the men pass the cup to us, we're going to sing of Jesus who paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. As you hold that cup, we're going to partake in just a minute, but Jesus left us something to perpetually remind us of the gospel. The bread that he became our sin on the cross, that he perfectly satisfied forever God's righteous wrath against sin so we don't have to punish ourselves. You know, that's what a lot of people do. They punish themselves a little bit more as if Christ didn't die enough. They've got to go through an extra few days of, of working through painful thinking that they're adding to what Jesus has already done. Did you know what the blood of Jesus Christ reminds us of? That by one sacrifice forever, he's already forgiven us of all our sins. And we silence the accuser. When, when sin abounds in our life, grace will much more abound the instant. That we acknowledge that Jesus paid it all. There's nothing I can do to add to it. All I have to do is receive his cleansing. He's already once and for all forgiven me. Jesus said that's what this cup is. It's a cup of blessing. And he said it's the cup of the new covenant that's in my blood. And he said every time we drink it, we remember him. Let's do that right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you for making me whole. Thank you for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. That's what we say thank you for this day. And I pray that we would go as those that are redeemed and we live like you're most important and we trust you and we want to follow you and listen to you and I pray that you would have the priority in our life over everything else so that we can enjoy life the way you designed it to be. In the precious name of Jesus we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you as you go.